So we are going to be in the book of First Peter. Uh, I heard Harry saying Timothy. I was like, well, I, maybe they were friends. I don't know. Um, but we're going to be in the epistle of First Peter. That's where we've been for the last uh, four weeks, five weeks, something like that. And our series that we have called Exiles, looking for hope in a world that's not our home. And uh, we ha- are just going through this bit by bit. And so today we're going to be in chapter 2, looking at verses 11 through 17. Again, my name is Brandon Caudle, by the way, Director of Family Ministries here at First Baptist Mount Healthy, also a part of the teaching team, along with our awesome senior pastor, Ken Dillard. And it's always a pleasure, a privilege to, to be able to share with you guys. And uh, we're just going to dive off. Uh, so I'm just going to read the passage, we'll pray, and then we'll, we'll get into it. And uh, just as a forewarning, this passage uh, is a very timely passage for the day and age in which we live. Uh, And so it ate my lunch all week long as I prepared this sermon, all right? So if it does the same to you, no, it did did it to me first, okay? (laughs) So 2 Peter, or 1 Peter rather, chapter 2, and we'll start in verse 11. Here's what Peter writes. He says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the opportunity, as always, to gather in your presence, to worship you, to sing songs uh, that just talk about how wonderful and amazing you are. And God, we come before you today and we acknowledge that we're sinners and that we need your grace, that we need the Holy Spirit to make sense of your word so it can apply appropriately to our hearts and to our lives so that we can be transformed people, God. And I pray, God, that you would forgive us for where we have failed you. I pray, God, that you would uh, forgive me, God, for where I have fallen short. And God, I pray that you would just help um, your word to go forth this morning, God, uh, and and change hearts and lives as only it can, change viewpoints, um, and just draw us nearer to you. Uh, We want to be more Christ-like in all that we do. And for our friends that might be here today or maybe they're watching online or listening later on the podcast, God, we pray that if they don't know you, that today would be the day of their salvation, that they would give their heart and their life to you, God, that you would transform them, draw them to yourself, and they would be um, followers of Jesus, brothers and sisters with us in your family. So God, we pray as we always do, what we know not teach us and what we are not please, please make us. And it's in Jesus' name we ask and pray these things. Amen. All right, so we live in a day and age in which a life of honor seems to be a rarity. Now, when I say the word honor, most of you might be thinking of knights in shining armor. Uh, you might be thinking of, of you know, fairy tales and, and things that speak to honor. But really, honor, living a life of honor, is just being a, a life of respect, showing respect to others, being an honorable person in your conduct. And that is a rarity, it seems like, in our day and age. There's been so much negativity, so much stress, so much pandemonium in our culture that even the kindest, nicest, most patient people that I know have begun to crumble. (laughs) The stress has just been unbearable for people. It's easy these days to choose dishonor. It's easy to get mad at somebody on social media and say, you know what? No, no. You just get mad at people. There's disrespect. It's real easy to to fall into negativity. And Peter has a timely word for us today about why it's important that we maintain our honor as followers of Jesus Christ. 
because it's very important for our witness. And as we've seen over the last four weeks, Peter has proclaimed the hope of the gospel to us. We looked at all of chapter one, bit by bit, and just saw the beautiful, amazing gospel of Jesus, how we're born to a living hope, how we have hope in him, how we have been forgiven, we have been transformed. It's amazing. And he has reminded us of the call to holiness and the call to love within the family of God, the church. You heard Ken preach about that last week. So now Peter is shifting gears a little bit, and he's going to begin laying the groundwork for the next section of the book for the rest of chapter 2 and into chapter 3. He lays this groundwork for why and how we as followers of Jesus are to live in relation to the world, to the people who do not know Jesus. Now remember a couple of weeks ago uh, from our study of holiness, um, I, I said this, I said the imperatives, right, what you are to be doing are always rooted in the indicatives, that is, who you are in Christ. So another way of saying that is you do not try to do these things out of your own works and, and try to, to do good works because you're a good person. That's, that's not what it is. We live out of the overflow of what Jesus has done for us. So the imperatives, what we are to be doing as Christians, are always rooted in our identity in Jesus, right? Because he has made us who he has made us. So now Peter is getting into the thick of it with us. And he is providing instructions for how we are to live honorably as followers of Jesus, as we serve Jesus on mission in this world. Because our conduct, the way that we treat others, the way that we engage with the world around us politically and ideologically and things of that nature, it matters substantially for our witness for Jesus. If we want to win people out there to the Lord, how we act really has a, a large part to play in that. And so Peter addresses some really important topics that uh, we as followers of Jesus need to be wrestling with. Things like honoring everyone, everyone made in God's image, not just those that you really like. Utilizing our lives as, and, and good deeds to put the gospel on display. Like we should be a giant billboard for Jesus, everything that we do. And then showing honor and respect to those in leadership, even when we disapprove of their character and disagree with their policies. So we're going to see today that Peter doesn't instruct followers of Jesus to hide from the world and hope for the best. That's not what he does. He's not saying, woo-wee, <laughs> you guys hunker down, right? It is really bad out there. If you just look down at your feet and don't look people in the eyes, then you won't have to talk to them. You can just go on about your day, put your blinders on. And man, it's bad out there, but woo, let's, let's hang out in here where we're all perfect and good. That's not what he's telling us to do. He doesn't tell us to yell at the world and drag our witness for Jesus through the mud either. <laughs> oh, they said, what now? Dude, I'm about to take them downtown in this Facebook comment section. You guys better watch out. I'm about to hogtie them with their little clever Twitter thread here. I'm going to bludgeon them into submission with my favorite meme that makes fun of their side of the argument. <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. Instead, Peter instructs us to live with honor to live with honor so that God will be glorified, Jesus will be magnified, and the spread of the gospel and mission of the church intensified. That's what he's asking us to do in this passage of Scripture that we have looked at today. And so what I would like to do is just examine four truths um, that Peter teaches us today from this text, all right? And I was a good Baptist today, uh, and they all are alliterated, okay? So they all start with R's. I guess I'm not very Baptist. I got four instead of three, and I don't have a poem, so I failed there. But here are the four truths. Realize the world is watching. That's what we're going to see, first couple of verses. Second truth, respect the government. Third truth, remember your true freedom. And then the fourth truth is repeat for good measure, because that's essentially what Peter does for us. So let's look at that first truth. Realize the world is watching, verses 11 and 12. So if you claim to be a Christian and represent the name of Christ, the world will be watching you. You are under a magnifying glass. We must make sure we honor Jesus in the gaze of the watchful eyes of unbelievers so that they see him and how amazing he is. 
That's how we are to be living our lives. And how do we do that? Well, look at verse 11. Peter says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles. He speaks to our identity. He speaks to who we are. This is three reminders of that. Beloved literally means dear friends. So we are loved by God, not because of what we do or what we did, but because of who he is and because of what Jesus did on the cross. And we love each other because he loved us first. We have been loved supremely. We should therefore love others as best we possibly can. So we're beloved. He calls us sojourners. A sojourner is somebody that's on a long journey. You're passing through a foreign land. It's not your homeland. And you have little to no rights there. You're on your way through to a better land. And then he says exiles. And this is where we drew the name from the series. Exiles are those who are displaced from their homeland. They're not at home. And they are residing in a place that is hostile to them. They are displaced. They are exiles. And that is who we are. We are beloved. We are sojourners and we are exiles. All three of those things describe who we are as followers of Christ. We are loved fiercely by the God of the universe. And he will shepherd us as exiles as we sojourn through this world. We belong to him. He is our king. We are first and foremost citizens of his kingdom, yes, and one day he will call us home to be with him. But what are we to do until then? What are we to do until we are finished with our sojourn, till we are not exiles any longer? Well, Peter tells us in verse 11. Here's what he says. He says, I urge you to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. So he frames this in kind of the negative sense, right? He's saying, hey, here's what you're not to do. Do not do this. He says, I urge you. And, and the tense there in the language is, I strongly urge you. This should have been done yesterday, like immediately, as soon as possible. It's a forceful command. And to Peter, this is an urgent matter. We are not playing games here. This is something that needs to happen immediately. He says to abstain. That, that means to continually abstain. It's not a one and done thing. It's something that is ongoing. You are continuing to hold yourself back from these things. And this isn't a one-time decision, but an ongoing fight for holiness. It's what we talked about a couple of weeks ago. And then what are we to abstain from? He says, passions of the flesh. And this can be understood as debauchery, as lust, drunkenness, idolatry. He lists some of these out as we get into 1 Peter chapter 4. You can see them in Galatians chapter 5. Paul lists those out there as he talks about walking in the Spirit. And this is what the world does. They fulfill selfish desires. They fulfill these desires in the wrong way. And followers of Christ have been freed from such things. Those things no longer rule us. They no longer hold us in bondage. So why abstain? Well, because these things wage war against your soul. That's what Peter is saying here. That means continually waging war. So we continually abstain because we are continually under attack. And we are at war on the deepest level. It's our soul, our innermost spiritual self. That's where Satan wages his war day by day, wave after wave, battle after battle for your heart. So once you become a born-again follower of Jesus, you enter into a never-ending battle with your old sinful nature. Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 7. It's been called the doo-doo chapter. I do this and I don't do that and I do this because I do this and I don't do that. You guys know what I'm talking about? Romans chapter 7, you guys should go check that out. Listen, Satan hates Jesus and he hates you. So your soul is a high-level target. Your soul is one of those targets that is constantly under attack, constantly under fire from the enemy. But nevertheless, we continually abstain. We abstain. We hold ourselves back from these things, not in our power, but in the power of the one who defeated Satan, who defeated that liar, who defeated that enemy, who defeated sin, who defeated hell. That's Jesus Christ. That's who we rest in. That's where our power comes from. He is the righteous one. He is the one by his grace who saved us from all sin and is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, as 1 John tells us. So friends, walk by the Spirit. That is how you're to be walking in this world. Allow Jesus to help you put to death the sins that trip you up and haunt you. 
Allow him to take that junk away. He forgave you of those things. Do not be held in bondage by them. So now, if that was the negative command, if that was the don't do this part, then what is Peter's positive command? What's he telling us to do, right? Because holiness is not just a bunch of you can't do things, right? Holiness is also about things you can do, right? It's not just a, a bunch of negatives. You don't do this. Don't do that. This is horrible. This is, this is how you live in holiness. It's just, it's just horrible for you to live in this world. No, Peter says, no, listen, there are positive things that you can do that are holy, that give you fulfillment, that show you how to live for Jesus. So what are we to do? Verse 12, he says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, right? So we see that word Gentiles, and we might be thinking, okay, well, Gentiles are people who are not Jewish. So who's he talking about here? Is he talking about a certain ethnicity? Remember, because they're in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. Uh, is he talking about a particular type of people? And honestly, right here, all he's doing to use that word, he uses the word Gentiles. He just means unbelievers. That's who, who Peter is singling out here. So when he says, live your life, your conduct, keep that honorable among the Gentiles, it's honorable among people who don't believe in Jesus, people who don't know him, that we are to be winning to him. And honorable, and I thought this was amazing as I was studying this week, the, this word for honorable in the original language can literally be translated as beautiful. Isn't that cool? Beautiful. Peter is saying, hey, Christian, hey, follower of Jesus, live a beautiful life among unbelievers. Live a life of beauty among these people that don't know Jesus so that they will see how wonderful and amazing he is. They are watching you. So live a life of beauty. So what does a beautiful life do? Well, it puts the glory and the grace of God on display, the power of the gospel on display for a watching world full of unbelievers who have no hope. And we have the message of hope for them. So how do we live a beautiful life? Well, we do good deeds. We don't do good deeds to make God love us, but because God loves us and because he has so transformed us, our works matter. We do good deeds to glorify him so that people will see them and glorify him. Well, what are some good deeds? Well, you could start small. You could, you know, go out to the restaurant today and leave a generous tip for your server. You could treat them with dignity because they're overworked and underpaid and, and we could treat them with respect and dignity. That's a good work. You could open your home to host those uh, who, who are in need that could never repay you for your hospitality. You could care for the elderly and the sick. You could provide comfort and companionship for them. You could care for the orphan by becoming a foster or adoptive home. You could volunteer to help refugees fleeing persecution acclimate to living in our city. You could search these things out. You could visit the prisoner locked up for their crimes. You could reach out to those who are lonely and struggling with mental health issues. You could simply listen to hurting people. Just be a listening ear and a shoulder for them to cry on. You could be a peacemaker. You could be humble. You could be joyful. You could be gentle. All of these things are beautiful things. And we do them not to earn God's favor, but because we've been shown God's favor. That's how we are to be living. These are noble acts that can be very, very powerful as we witness about the gospel of Jesus to an unbelieving world. So beautiful things. So listen, God has given us a great opportunity as his people to put the beautiful gospel on display in a day and age when it seems like everyone wants to spew hatred, everyone wants to sow division, Everyone wants to just pummel each other. We live in a day and age where God is saying, do beautiful things so people will see how beautiful I am. So instead, what we should be doing is we should be not joining into the ugliness of the world. We are to live a life of beauty. And we are to do this even when we are mocked, even when we are slandered. Look at the rest of verse 12 there. It says, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. 
So the early Christians, the ones that Peter is writing to here, were accused of all kinds of horrible things. They were accused of cannibalism because of the language around the Lord's Supper, right? Just eat my flesh, drink my blood. They were accused of being cannibals. They were accused of incest because they loved each other and called one another brother and sister. Ironically enough, they were accused of atheism because their God was invisible and you couldn't see him. They were accused of treason because they would not honor and pledge allegiance to Caesar. They would not serve in his army. And there was a various other forms of, of immorality that they were accused of. But notice that Peter, he doesn't say, hey, hey, listen, guys, when you're accused of something, hit back harder than they hit you. He doesn't say do that, does he? He doesn't say do that. He doesn't say, hey, if they complain about you, you complain about them even louder. Tear them a new one <laughs> so that they won't talk ugly of you again. He doesn't say do those things. He says to live a beautiful and honorable life. That's what we are called to do. And we do that so that our good deeds will be seen and the Father glorified. It's not for our glorification. It's not for our goodness and our glory. It's for the Father. So what if instead of complaining about our current societal woes and political disagreements, what if we actually worked to bless our city? What if we did that instead? What if we actually channeled all of that energy that all of us, I think, have been guilty of, of channeling sometimes, of all this energy? Maybe what if, we, what if we channeled all of that energy from arguing and fighting into truly loving our neighbors? I'll tell you what would happen. The world would be changed. Things would be different. Our city would be completely different. And Jeremiah's words to the Israelites living in Babylon, they were in exile. Remember, we talked about this when we studied Zechariah. They had come back from exile. They had been in Babylon for over 70 years. And we see that as they are living in Babylon, uh, Jeremiah writes to them because they were being lied to by false prophets saying, Hey, you know, we're only going to be here just a little while. Then we'll go back. Things are just going to be honky-dory. You guys don't have to settle in. And that was false. God said, No. I said you were going to be there. You are in exile for sinning against me. And I have spoken my word. And so Jeremiah, as the faithful prophet, he writes to those who are in Babylon, Jeremiah 29, verses 4 through 7. And here's what he says to them. It's very applicable to us today. He says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Verse 5, Build houses and live in them. <laughs> Doesn't sound like they're going to be there for a short time, right? Build houses, live in them, plant gardens, and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare." So did you catch the instructions to God's people living in a, in a foreign culture, in a lost and pagan world? Did you catch that? They weren't commanded by the Lord to complain. They weren't commanded by the Lord to just keep their head down and not engage. They were not instructed to rise up and rage against the king there. Instead, they were to seek the welfare of the city. That's in pretty much lockstep with living a beautiful and honorable life as a Christian, right? Right? In much the same way in our text today, Peter says the same thing. He doesn't tell his readers to put a don't tread on me Nero bumper sticker on the back of their donkey, does he? He doesn't tell them to do that. He says, go and do good. Live a beautiful life. He doesn't say go on social media and argue with people because we all know that that always changes somebody's mind. He doesn't say that. He says, go live a beautiful life. Be honorable. Treat people with dignity. And this idea of the unbelieving world seeing, as he says, our good deeds isn't like a passing glance. It's not just like a, oh, I'm just going to look at something and look away. This is, this is more akin to carefully studying and considering something. So think about that. Somebody that watches your life day in and day out for weeks, months, years on end, who is an unbeliever, your conduct and your faithful witness to them over time, God can use that and bless that and see them come to know Jesus. So think about that. It's, it's 
think of using a microscope. Our lives are under a microscope. That's how some unbelievers in this world watch us as we live our lives for Jesus. And so that's why we must be consistent in our actions, not just in person, but also digitally out there in the internet world, on social media. Every interaction we have, we should be treating that in an honorable way. Doing so, Peter says, will bring glory to God on the day of visitation. Now, what's he talking about there? What's this day of visitation? And there's a ton of debate among scholars and and commentators about what Peter meant here, but I think the overall point is clear. A beautiful life lived for Christ that declares the beautiful gospel of Christ can lead others to know him and bring glory to God. That's what he's saying. Listen, the day of visitation is the day of their salvation. When they can come to know Jesus, if we live a beautiful life for Jesus and we declare his beautiful message, then people will come to know him and God will be glorified. So friends, realize that the world is watching. So what do they see when they watch you? What do they read when they read your broadcasts and your posts on the internet? What do they see in the pictures that you share What are people seeing? Are they seeing honor and respect? Are they seeing pettiness? Are they seeing things that are trivial? Are they seeing things that are tearing other people who are made in the image of God down to make you and your side of the argument feel better? What are people seeing when they watch you? Number two, and this is a tough one, respect the government. Verses 13 and 15. Along with Paul's teaching on Romans 13, right? In Romans 13, you can see that there. This is one of the main texts on how we as Christians are to relate to government officials. This is how we are to relate and show honor and respect to those that God has put into leadership over us and his sovereignty. How we are to treat them, how we are to to relate to them. Even when we don't particularly care for their attitudes, their actions, their policies, we have clear commands of how we are to relate and act. Because government and politics is such a source of division right now in our country, and it has been for years, but it seems very, very sharp in our day and age. We're going to do our best to walk through these next few verses so that we can understand them and apply what Peter is saying. And as I said in the beginning, I've been doing this all week long, right? So if the, if the, if the sword of the Spirit is cutting me up inside, just be prepared. It might cut you a little bit this morning too. So verse 13, it says, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. So notice that Peter says we are to be subject to. Your translation might say submit. We are to be in submission to the governing authorities over us. And he actually used a military term here. This is interesting. This this military term of a chain of command. And it can, can literally mean to arrange oneself under authority. So we fall in line. We fall into ranks. That's what he's telling us to do. And man, we don't like that do we? (laughs) We do not like submitting to governing authorities. We don't like recognizing their role in God's world because he's the one that created the world. He created them. He gave them the spirit of life as well, the breath of life in them. And he said, I'm going to put them in, in authority over people. We see that God is the one behind all that. And that's a tough word from scripture in our ears, isn't it? To submit to people that we don't really particularly agree with. Why is respecting officials so hard for us? Why do we bristle at that thought? Well, here's a few reasons. Number one, we're sinners. First and foremost, we are sinful people. And rebellion is in our blood. It's as old as the garden. It's as old as Adam and Eve. We are sinful people. So therefore, we don't like submitting. We don't like falling in line. Number two, we're Americans. Absolutely. We don't bend the knee to anyone, right? Just ask King George III how that worked out for him. (laughs) When you're gone, I'll go mad. Don't throw away this thing we had, right? He's like, say, listen, listen, 
We don't bend the knee because we are Americans. We throw tea in the harbor and we rebel against the king. Number three, we have freedom of speech. And free speech is an absolutely wonderful right that we have. We are blessed with in this country. It is a gift, and I am benefiting from it right now in this moment. So do not misunderstand me. Free speech is amazing. It's wonderful, but it can be hijacked and used dishonorably to foster division and rebellion and spread disinformation. So that's why it's become almost a sport in our day and age to trash and belittle governing authorities like it's, like it's a sport. It's a form of entertainment. We see people benefit from it and make a paycheck from it on talk radio and on TV, political talking heads. And we're obsessed with that. And we see people being treated dishonorably all the time, and I think we've just kind of grown numb to it. And number four, we've been burned by authority. I'm pretty sure all of us have. Many of us, many of us have had someone in authority hurt us. Someone in authority traumatize us. Could be a parent. Could be a teacher. Could be, heaven forbid, a pastoral figure. Somebody has hurt you that was in an authoritative position. And we've been burned by that. And that deep distrust is often legitimate. So this is a very unpopular passage, and it's definitely not well received in our current political climate. But we must remember that Peter wasn't writing this in a perfect political climate either. I mean, it's not like things were just honky-dory for them. Remember, we talked about this. Nero was the emperor. He was in charge. He was insane. He killed his own mother who helped him get to the throne. He didn't care. He hated Christians. He burnt them alive. He wrapped them in animal skins and fed them to lions. He hated people. He was a man who was insane. And he happily put many Christians to death. But under Nero, under that leader, Paul still wrote Romans 13. And under that leader, Peter still wrote 1 Peter chapter 2. So their goal was not to incite political unrest. That was never the goal of the early Christians. It was to be faithful missionaries to their culture, leading others to do the same. So now, of course, there are exceptions. When the demands of society threaten to override the demands of the Lord, there are exceptions, right? But like in Romans 13, Peter doesn't mention specific exceptions here. I mean, Peter was the one who literally said in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, we must obey God rather than man. <laughs> they, were, they were civilly disobeying at that point. They were told not to teach about Jesus, and the apostles kept teaching. So we are to engage in civil disobedience only when the government prohibits us from doing what the Lord commands, or when it commands us to do what the Lord prohibits. There are exceptions when we can civilly disagree and disobey. You can still do that honorably. This is implicit in every exhortation to submit. And so throughout Scripture, we have various ways in which we are to submit as unto the Lord is the language that we see used throughout the New Testament. That is, in a way that doesn't violate Scripture or dishonor the Lord or dishonor our witness. So it's not blind submission. That's not what I'm talking about. And notice the extent that Peter describes. He says every human institution. But wait a minute. What about, what about this one? No, every human institution. What about that, this one over here on the left or on the right? Every human institution institution. Literally, every human creature. That's the word that he uses there. Every human creature. He's drawing attention to how human authority is very different from divine authority. It's Peter playing with the words and the language here. Human leaders, no matter how powerful they may be, are still creatures created by the king of everything. And the only power they have is given from him. So they are created. So yes, give human leaders their due. Honor them as you should, but assign glory and ultimate allegiance to God alone. He is the creator, not a political party. And why do we do this? Why do we submit to human authorities? Why do we respect the government? Well, Peter says, for the Lord's sake. 
That's what he says. That's the reason why. Peter says that we do this to please God. It's for the sake of the Lord. It brings him glory when we show honor in this way. And when you pay your taxes, it honors the Lord. When you are a good citizen, it honors the Lord. When you follow the speed limit, it honors the Lord. It is on his account that we do these things. We do everything for the glory of God. And Peter also says in verse 15 that we are to respect the government because it is the will of God. End of story. It's God's will. We should be about God's will. We should have our hearts filled with the desires of God's heart. It is his will, and we should seek his will in all aspects of our lives. It doesn't mean that we have to agree with it. It doesn't mean we have to like those in power, but we do have an obligation to live honorably and show respect. And finally, Peter points to our witness for Jesus when we honor the government. He says that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Silence literally means to muzzle. Think about that muzzling a dog so it can't bark anymore. He's saying, listen, you do these things, it puts to silence people who are ignorant about these things. So in other words, living a Christ-honoring, respectful life will ultimately shut down and shut up accusations brought against you if you're a Christian. Live a beautiful life. To be clear, the government has no right to tell us what to preach and teach, never. If they do, we have the duty to humbly yet boldly disobey like the apostles did in Acts 4 and 5. However, this is where we don't like things. The government does have a right to tell us what the fire code should be, right? They do have us a right to tell us what the building code should be. They do have a right to tell us that it can be helpful to wear a mask to protect others from a virus. They have the right to say those things. That doesn't violate scripture and it's wise and safe for us to obey those things because it can tarnish our witness if we want to argue about small, trivial things in the long run. So by submitting to basic laws and regulations, we can silence any claims, any claims that we're some rebellious and arrogant group doing whatever we please, like we're a bunch of mavericks. Such an attitude doesn't commend the gospel, friends. You lose way more than you gain. Our witness must be protected. So let's not make every molehill a mountain. Let's not die on every hill. Just the things that compromise God's word and, and a faithful life to him. So honor the government, yes, but do so while remembering that God is the ultimate authority. Never lose sight of that. I know that I despair sometimes, and I think of looking at, at how the government's ran and looking at politics and, and all the climate around that right now, and I begin to despair, but then I'm reminded that God is the ultimate authority. He is the one that's in control. And it's in his sovereignty and in his providence that these things are in place over us. So no matter who is in power— Realize that God has his purposes. He is working them out. He knows what he is doing. And every government leader, no matter how rotten or how awesome you think they are, will one day answer to him. He's going to set everything right one day. And so many Christians seem to lose their minds when it comes to politics because I believe they fail to see the God who is over the government the one who has put people in place. And so should we engage in the process? Yes, of course. We live in a country where we can vote and our voice matters and we should go do those things. That is a blessing. Should we speak truth to power? Absolutely when we're able to. If you're in a position to do that, yes, speak truth to power. Work for justice and lament over the lack of it. But freak out and make an idol out of a leader or a political party, a candidate, a system, absolutely not. Our allegiance lies elsewhere. That's where we are to keep our eyes. So friends, live a life that honors and respects the government and take comfort in the fact that God will have the last word. As much as it's unto you, as much as you're able, live at peace with everyone. Show honor is what the resounding chime of the New Testament is. So respect the government. And then number three, remember your true freedom. So look at verse 16. Live as people who are free. That's the command. Notice Peter doesn't, Peter doesn't tell these persecuted Christians to become insurgents. He doesn't tell them to attack Roman troops. He tells them to live out their true 
identity as free people. So what kind of freedom is this? What kind of freedom is he talking about? Well, the freedom that we have in Christ is what he's talking about. And that freedom is so much more than political freedom. We have freedom in Jesus. We don't have freedom in a political party. It's freedom from the rule of sin in our lives. It's freedom from guilt because our sins have been forgiven by a holy God through what his son did on the cross. And freedom from the trap of thinking that we have to earn God's favor. We don't have to do that. We just trust Jesus. And how are we to use this freedom. Well, look at the rest of verse 16. He says, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. So brothers and sisters, we have the greatest of freedoms in Jesus. If we want to be free people, we look to Jesus. He frees us from the things that hold us in bondage, that keep us from eternal life with him that keep us from total damnation for eternity in hell. He frees us from those things. The freedom that we have in Jesus is amazing. We are freed from condemnation. We are free from the law, but not free to be disrespectful and dishonorable. We do not use our freedom in Christ to disobey human laws unless they are in direct conflict with God's ways. We already talked about that. And also, we don't use this freedom to disobey God. We don't abuse his grace. We don't say, I'm free in Christ, so I can do these things. We don't do that. We, we don't disobey God. Rather, we are free to obey him. <laughs> That's what the freedom is. And there's a paradox there, isn't it? Peter says that we are his servants. So how can we be servants, literally doulos, slaves to God, and still be free? That's a paradox, right? Well, we are free, yet we are servants. We are free to serve God with a clean heart and a life of holiness that he helps us live. We glorify God when we serve him faithfully. So remember your true freedom today. Freedom in Jesus is the best thing that you can have. If you are in Christ, you are free. So how are you using this freedom today? Are you using it to honor others? Are you using it to live a life of beauty? Or are you using it, as Peter says here, uh, to cover up sin? How are you living your life in freedom with Jesus today? And then number four, repeat for good measure. So in verse 17, Peter, he essentially gets to the end of this passage, and he, he distills most of what he has already said into four commands, all right? This is uh, uh, one verse with four commands. Verse 17, it says, honor everyone. There's no room for but here. Honor everyone. The command is clear. Everyone. It doesn't matter who they are or what they've done. It doesn't matter if you agree with them or even really like them. They are worthy of honor because they are made in the image of God. He says, honor everyone. He says, also love the brotherhood. This means that we are to love one another in the church. If we are Christians, we love our brothers and sisters in Christ. We are God's people. We have been adopted into his family. We are brothers and sisters. And it matters to God that his children love one another. And our love for one another shows the world Jesus. So we are to love the brotherhood. Third, he says, fear God. Now, this isn't a fear as like you would fear an abusive father or that you would fear a brutal slave master. It's not that kind of fear. He's saying, listen, stand in awe and reverence of God. That kind of fear. It's a positive fear. It's a fear of the God of the universe and his authority. And then, for good measure, Peter says, honor the emperor. Listen, you don't have to agree with rulers' politics in order to honor them in a way that honors God. You don't have to agree. You can respect the office even when we disagree with the leader. But notice how this command comes after fear God. Did you guys catch that? He said fear God before he said honor the emperor. That's Peter putting things in the proper order. So yes, we honor those in authority over us. We respect the government but we do not worship them. That is reserved for God alone. That's where our ultimate worship lies. So then, what are we to do with all of this? How does this 
apply to our lives? What are some practical things we can do to implement this teaching today? Well, number one, pray for your leaders. As God's people, we have been commanded to do that. Paul tells us in 1 Timothy to pray for every leader and pray that we can have a peaceful and quiet life so that we can worship the Lord and do good things. We have a part to play in that by praying for the leaders and showing them honor. Spend less time criticizing and more time praying. Number two, be a good citizen. Pay your taxes. Obey the laws. Be respectful. Live with a clear and clean conscience before God because you're doing the things you're called to do. These are things that good citizens do. Number two, seek the welfare of your city. We talked about that just a few moments ago. Get involved. Engage in the political system for truth and justice. Do those things. Look for ways to serve our city and our country for the common good. And, and do that in an honorable and beautiful way. Number four, discern truth from disinformation. We have this thing called the Holy Spirit that can help us do that. And before sharing something on social media or passing along some scrap of information that you've heard, check your sources first. Make sure that that is truthful. Make sure that that is honoring. Make sure that's a beautiful thing that you can stand before God and say, I shared that and I can faithfully do that as, as a witness for you. If you can't say that, then don't share it. Don't pass that along. Is this information true? Can it be verified? Is it priority or is it propaganda? Ask yourself those questions. Discern truth from disinformation. Trust the Holy Spirit to help you do that. Number five, rest in the providence of God. That's another thing we can do. We can calm down. <laughs> we can just take a breath for a moment. We can be still and know that he is God, that he is sovereign. No matter the circumstances, no matter what's going on, our testimony will always be the Lord of all creation is in control. That is our testimony day in and day out. He's got this. COVID is tearing through our population. We're seeing people die. We're seeing Marines die in Afghanistan. We're seeing people, refugees over there falling from airplanes. It's tough and it makes me want to cry, but you know what? Be still and know that he is God. He is the one that's in control of these things. He is the one that's got it under control. We don't understand it. We are called to be obedient and be honoring in this time in which we live. So we trust that he is God and that he has provided what we need to live for him. And then number six, we pledge our allegiance to the one true king. That's where our true allegiance lies. Jesus, the one who had all honor before creation. <laughs> Jesus, the one who emptied himself, who lived and suffered unjustly, who died on behalf of his enemies and rose from the grave. That's the Jesus we serve, the one who has forgiven our sins, the one who has given us a new life, the one who has, uh, has given us a living hope, as Peter has already told us. He is the one worthy of all honor and glory and our true allegiance. That's who we pledge allegiance to. And very soon, Jesus will establish a one-party kingdom in which he will rule with perfect peace and justice forever. We can put our faith and trust in that. As the old hymn goes, I can remember singing as a kid in church, kings and kingdoms will all pass away. But there's something about that name. Jesus, the name above all names, the king above all kings, the one who who is over any political leader now and all throughout history or any that will ever come, they are all in submission to him. We can rest in those things. And that frees us, friends, that frees us to live a beautiful and honoring life among unbelievers. How you act matters. The things you post on the internet matter. The way you talk about government leaders matters. The world is watching. We don't have to please them, but we do have to live honorably among them and respect them and win them to the Lord. So do you know him today? That's my question. If you do, ask him to help you live a beautiful life, an honoring, honorable life. And if you don't know him today, then I ask you to repent. That just means turn and walk in a different direction. Turn from the things of the world. Turn from the things that rule your life now and turn to Jesus. Just pivot. 
Ask him to help you do that today. Ask him to forgive you of your sins. Just say, I give my heart and my life to you. Forgive me of my sins and help me to follow after you. Do that. Step out in faith. Come down and talk to me or Ken about that. We can tell you everything that you need to know, everything that we know about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Don't tarry any longer, friends. Today is the day of that salvation. Today is the day that you can begin living a beautiful life.